I usually say this at the end, but if you're listening to this right now, hit me up, DM me at Iconic or the Benchmob NBA, wherever you follow us. And let's talk about the team you support. I like talking to a bunch of different people on this podcast. So we got Joseph over here. Twitter handle. I don't know what your Twitter handle is, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but people probably know you from Twitter if they do at all. What's up, man? How's it going? It's going great, man. Thank you for having me on. Excited to be here. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. We met back in Summer League last year, and I felt like this podcast was bound to happen at some point. Um, your, your Twitter <laughs> takes are on fire, generally. But I, I, I like it because because I generally view myself as someone who thinks the opposite of what most people think <laughs> in many regards, not just basketball. So we definitely relate on that level. But how's it going, man? Uh, I'm going great, man. This is the the busiest part of my year. Uh, people want to get better for that either conference push if you're in college or if mm-hmm. you're a player, you want to get better and start thinking about your options in the summer. Um, so yeah, I mean, like you know, I, I I stay busy and I'm a little bit not burnt out, but a little sleep deprived. That's fine. Um, and yeah, I, <laughs> this is this is a nice little like mental vacation. I'm just talking to my buddy. So so for the people that may not know you or who you are and what you do. What do you do, and who are you? <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm, uh, I'm Joseph Gill at Joseph Gill MA. Um, you might remember me from getting yelled at by your team's favorite beat writer. Um, <laughs> basically, basically, what I do is I, uh, I I try to work directly with players for analytical consulting. I work with a few college teams on that same front. Um, I kind of fell butt backwards into it, and I realized that like I really actually enjoy it, and I'm pretty good at it. So I've um, been doing that for the last four years now, and uh, and yeah. Um, that's that's pretty much as concisely I think as I can put it. Um, yeah. So basically, you find value where other people can't, and practically apply it to a player's game, and that right. in turn makes them money, which in turn makes you money if you're good at it. Um, right. that, exactly. That's the business model in a nutshell. Um, and yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I do like uh, that area obviously analytics salary cap it all kind of combines together but then you have the playing experience back in i don't know you played what d3 or did you play college i forgot i I played uh it's i'm I'm technically in the rule books is playing d3 i played three uh college games um i was blessed with some pretty impressively paper mache knees and so (laughs) um from the time that i was like 16 17 while everyone else was getting stronger and faster i was in the weight room like i don't know if i'm gonna last and so i started kind of like i i always wanted to be a scout or like an assistant coach or you know like in that vein and then uh, as analytics started taking off, I've always been mathematically inclined. And um, I kind of realized that there was a really strong potential to merge, you know, like my basketball background, uh, the communication skills that I've learned over the years, and then also the the analytics knowledge that I just kept gaining and, you know, growing and growing and growing. And then, yeah, it all kind of just came together. And uh, it's it's been, a, it's been fun, you know. Well, we're going to take all those and then combine it with your love of just talking a lot um (laughs) for for the for the next you know 45 ish minutes uh and have a fun little conversation here one i just normally i don't you know i just wanted to have you on to talk about just big topic things things that are on our head that we can kind of talk about just at whim because there's a lot to talk about um the first thing you mentioned here i'm reading straight from your text message um some (laughs) mid-range some mid-range stuff you did you, yeah. did a, you did a long article i did not read the article i'll be fully honest but i have no, so I thought <laughs> thought about this mid-range topic i'm curious where you're gonna take it and i'm sure we'll take it in a lot of different directions but i'm just gonna open it up to you um what was your article about what kind of research did you did did you do and, and all that yeah, so it's it's a very long, it's a three part article that I released on uh, my friend Reed uh skills training website, mm-hmm. and so like you know most of the stuff that I do. What's the um, website? Uh, CatalystTraining.com. All right, go um, check it out. Yeah, no, he's he's reads reads a lot like me where I'm very niche with my with my base knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm like a puddle that's very deep. Um, <laughs> Reed is is it's funny. Reed actually recruited me in college, and then when I showed up to campus, I was like, "Where's Reed?" And they're like, "Oh, it took another job." You know, did you did you hear? And I, it's like, well, <laughs> college basketball is how that works. And you know, we've kind of stayed in touch over the years. And uh, you know, Reed's a really cool. Tra- like I I've got a 
I, I could talk about any one of the skills trainers I talk to in this regard, but we'll stick on Reed because, you know, it's where the article's hosted. But he's cool in the sense, of like, you know, he has a great base of knowledge, mm-hmm. but his big thing is about foot control. Okay. He's like, he's like a footwork czar where, like, you know, any, any time, like, you know, like a move is successful and it gets separation, he can tell you exactly why with weight distribution and all that. So, but anyway, to get back to the article, so the article is, it's, it's, it's aggressive. It's three parts, it's about 7,000 words. Um, Glad and I it was based. It. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's why I, I was surprised that you did but um but yeah it's basically you know like it's funny like you and i talk about all the time with analytics where this is great product um and i talk about this in the article where it feels like a lot of professionals in the analytics world kind of assume they'd win this war of attrition on the general public the basketball playing public where you know if given enough time analytics will have a higher success rate than conventional wisdom and therefore they'd win people over and so i've kind of thought that you know ever since I started learning about analytics, which was over a decade ago at this point. I've kind of thought that the analytics community kind of sandbags on the communicational aspects of it. And so I kind of build my brand around that. And, you know, like the stuff that I'm doing in the article, it's not very, you know, like if, if you're somebody who's who's already on board with analytics and you're somebody who already believes in this stuff or, you know, like doesn't really want to talk about the mid-range, uh, you know, because you already know what, what it's about, you'll get nothing out of it. But, you know, if you're a coach who's in high school, if you're a skills trainer, you're a player who's kind of, you know, like on the fence and actually like wants to just like have a deep dive into all these conversations, all these hypothetical situations that I, you know, very simply try to try to delineate um, I, th- I think you'd like it, you know, so I'm not sure if your audience base is exactly the audience that I'm after with it, but it was fun to write, you know, I'm writing about game situations. I'm writing about, you know, articles, uh, some, uh, arguments for the mid range arguments for three, which most of them are, I'm talking about the conversations I've had over the years with Dion Lee, who's D'Angelo Russell's main skill trainer. And it's fine. Dion, Dion's a guy who tied the big 10 record for most threes made in the game when he was playing you know and then he's talking about how you can shoot 55 to 60 percent from the mid-range and at first i was like no you can't and then i got to know him and i i took in his arguments and his argument is like i'm not saying everybody can do this i'm saying like if you work with me and you focus on you know the inputs of these shots to a very incredibly granular degree and you're very self-critical after um, an amount of time, you can shoot this from the mid-range. And I'm like, you know, I hate to admit it, but I I, I don't hate to admit it because it's, it's just a fact. But, like, I, I agree. You know, you can shoot 55% on some mid-range shots if you work at it. And so the whole, the whole argument is – the whole article is trying to, like, you know, like – rectify this take of you know like the the, there's incredible value in the three-point shot but also you know to take this full-on approach to the mid-range can never be a good shot is just gonna make people dislike you you know well there's a there's a lot of different things going on here and um so first of all touching on like the people accepting or like listening to analytics or explaining analytics or, or whatever that's always an interesting thing to me because people don't like to make it selfish for the person they're talking to they try to make it like seem like they need to believe what you're saying so right. what, what i mean by that is that there's this like holier than thou sense when some people try to spit numbers and like and and then the person that you're talking to doesn't like that tone or like it goes against what they normally would think so just telling them no you're wrong is different than taking the approach that you know me and you kind of like to take in a lot of senses is you try to explain to them what why it's like that and why things in their argument actually can be aided from the analytics if they're talking uh you know logically absolutely (laughs) um and then the the thing i want to get back to the technical aspect of like the mid-range shot and what it's worth i was actually just watching um a couple days ago uh ben taylor's thinking basketball he did a nice uh video on this exact topic like the mid-range and its value and how if you're a really good mid-range shooter then drop coverage um doesn't really work against you because if you shoot like you said 55 60 percent from mid-range or even like just above 50 percent right that value then it also brings up the drop coverage which then opens up either the lane or the paint area for a cutter or whatever or it doesn't allow you to you know play the system that allows mid-ranges because like a Kawhi or chris paul is very efficient at those shots so then either a three point opens up a lane or cut opens up other things open up that are more valuable shots than the mid-range just because your mid-range is dangerous and i think that was a really interesting point um and i'm going all over the place but one other thing that i wanted to mention and i'm just gonna let you pick and choose from these three things (laughs) um i mean you know me i'm I'm gonna i'm gonna 
choose well, all three so, if I can. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so one thing that that's really interesting to me about this is the the distance is linearly like if if you think about shot difficulty, like it's probably not linear in terms of difficulty, but like it's probably fairly close. But the delineation of getting one hundred fifty percent of the points right. is very li- is just very like cut in the sand, line in the sand. It's it's just a line, right? So while the distance might linearly make it slightly more difficult, there's a step function in the amount of points you get at a certain distance, which is why the three point has exploded and probably is still going to be more valuable than the mid range, regardless of how undervalued the mid range might be today. Right. And you know, I mean, yes, I mean, you just you picked three things that I want to talk about, <laughs> talk about for for an hour. But yeah, I mean, to to kind of touch on, you know, to go back to like to tie us all back to what I do. Um, so I, I I was blessed enough where when I decided that I wanted to do this, um, I I had somebody reach out with two clients uh, within a couple months, and so I was working with two guys, one who was about to be an NBA player, one who was already an NBA player, and the first guy I worked with, I didn't win him over. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, it's one of those things where like, I, I, it was, it's funny, like, you know, if, uh, the book, um, gosh, this is, I was why liars poker, um, mm-hmm. by, uh, who wrote Moneyball again? Sorry. I, I should know I this know, off. I don't know who wrote Moneyball. I'm, I'm not a big reader. I'm a listener <laughs> and visual kind of guy, but yeah. But yeah, it's by, uh, it's by Michael Lewis. So Michael okay. Lewis talks about, he, he's a, tra- he's a trader on wall street and his first three months on the job, once he's given the job and he goes through the, the, the educational program, he's just blowing people up. And what he means by that is, you know, he's learning, there's only so much you can learn about the trade, yeah. uh, while you're in the classroom, then you, you have to have the practical knowledge, but no one wants to be the first client because they understand that you don't have the practical knowledge yet. So like, I, I, I didn't contribute to this player, you know, like bombing at the league. That's a real, was, sorry, yeah. sorry. That, that's a really no, interesting point. Just non basketball related like the fact that the innovation generally doesn't have data to back it up because it's innovation it's like the, the, the definition yeah. of innovation and then so people are scared to jump in first but you also can't actually prove that it works until you actually do it so it's like that's where i mean this is like a consulting thing where right a lot of a lot of companies like to make decisions based off strictly prior data where the prior methods and systems are could be just completely outdated um right. and and they're just but they're familiar there's a amount of data behind it they want they want to believe that they can be the ones to assess this data in such a creative way that nobody else has come up with it and therefore make an edge and it, it's just it, it just yeah it's sometimes it's intuition is required and and yep. when, when you're yeah data driven is great to understand where some flaws are i think data driven like data-driven decisions generally lead to identifying the weaknesses where innovation needs to be tested to collect yep. data instead absolutely and anyway um back to back to what you were saying <laughs> yeah so i so I, uh you know as i was mentioning like you know i i didn't i didn't this player didn't bomb out of the league because i was involved this player was mm-hmm. already on a massively downward trajectory yeah. and you know it was it, it, and I, I hate talking about anybody's life like this but the reality is that like you know if there was a situation to figure this stuff out for myself for three or four months um I, did I help this player? I did. I can mathematically prove that I did help this player in some regards, but at the same time, it wasn't enough. And I also got those reps in where, yeah, you know, so the first player didn't win over at all. The second player, it literally took me, you know, like we, we were talking about the player before we hopped on and started recording yeah. the mics, but it took me about three to four months um, of very consistent communication to like, to win him over to pretty much 100% of my package. You know, there, there was a certain amount of my package that he was willing to accept immediately. But then, you know, you're dealing with all these entrenched biases of these people. And it's also one of those things where it's like, dude, I played, as you mentioned, I played three games of division three basketball. Uh, if I walk up to Giannis Antetokounmpo on the street, I could have all the Intel in the world in his game. How the hell am I going to convince this guy who has lived this life, who has done these things, who was incredible at his craft, that he should outsource some of his thinking when he's gotten to where he is in life because he does now source most of his thinking to me um and so it's a it's a very interesting dance like you know you had to prove that you're you're very trustworthy with you know your educational background then you have mm-hmm. to communicate these ideas in the correct way um and you have to make concessions at a certain point but uh but yeah so you know and you're talking about the mid-range as a as an option you know it kind of all ties back to my my theory of basketball and analytics is that like you know when i'm going to to a coach or a player um most of the adjustments that I suggest are very simple. 
And, you know, like I can't always draw a direct ma- mathematical extrapolation to how I expect it's going to help their offense or their defense. But I can point to priors where I'm like, you know, it helped these people this much percent. You know, when this team made this change 10 years ago, whether or not it was because of analytics or not, you know, it helped their production over the next blank games by Y percent. Um, you know, I, I've always said to people that you know, like part of the dance of analytics is knowing that, you know, like not everything in basketball, nothing in basketball happens in a vacuum except for the final uh, score. And if you're going to suggest that a player, you know, post up 10 percent more often or go over his left shoulder 20 percent more often when he's in the post, there are going to be other unforeseen consequences to those actions. And you have to be able to anticipate them and you have to know how these systems all interchange and work together, because, you know, if you're going to tell a player to completely cut the mid range um, at a certain point the the ecosystem is going to adjust so everything kind of falls to a certain point to a, a market homeostasis where you know like the market becomes static and it doesn't really change and you know when, when you when you induce change in that market it adjusts and then all of a sudden you know you have a completely different market um so yeah it's it, it's very it's very complex it's a still in my opinion it, it's a very complex topic um it's one where one side uh is probably bringing in my opinion uh, either too much or not enough information, you know, either too much granular information or not enough information uh, outside of their overall talking point of, you know, the raw efficiencies are lower. And then another side, a lot of people, you know, th- there's a certain amount of people who want to continue to muddy the waters because they're, you know, they, they don't believe in analytics, you know, or, or they, they are incentivized to not believe in analytics and they want to just continue to toss in uh stuff to muddy these waters to try and make it you know a less convincing argument and when you actually like you know start breaking down the arguments again you know for the mid-range they very quickly fall apart beyond one or two level thinking you know so that's what the article is trying to do well i think one thing that i've kind of been thinking about a lot lately is the fact that every all-time great basically um is predominantly fully rim or mid-range shooter no right. no all-time like top five ten player is a knockdown shooter besides like kevin durant maybe or like depending on where you land on where steph curry lines up but th- those are like more recent even the current superstars like the top three players if you ask anyone it's probably going to be like lebron Kawhi, Giannis type you know answers and right. at worst top five those three players are in the top five um and those none of those guys are, are full shooters or full three and but they're the type of guy like playmaking all around wing that you need that's not the knockdown shooter um and well knockdown shooter in the sense of a three-point shot and it's because one the physicality and the athleticism that you need um Two, it's getting to the rim. Getting closer is easier to score regardless, right? Uh, In terms of difficulty of shot making. And yeah, the three-pointer is worth a lot more. But when you try to game a system and a game of skill, and, and when you try to fully apply data into a game where the result is based on small sample sizes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> right? Yep. Like one game like it doesn't matter what the big data of NBA like tracking tells you, it's still one game that's going to decide it. And yeah, I, I that gets into like expected values and whatever, but for me, there's too many examples of the the top of the top greats. Now, the people that are surrounding those greats need to be shooters because they need room to operate. But it's just like, where is the value? That's why for me, and I'm curious what you think about this, um, after like athleticism and mindset, which are things that are, I think mindset is more important than anything for basketball players, first of all. In terms oh, of yeah. Like, oh, agree. You know, yes. like, I, I can't, I can't, I cannot endorse that opinion en- enough. And, that, yeah. and that's not, not just me speaking. I mean, I, I was blessed where I got to play uh, in high school in an absolute basketball factory where I got an incredibly high level coaching from a young age. And uh, we had 61 recruits in my graduating class alone in Minnesota, which sounds impossible. Um, you know, we, we, we had a, uh, a stepdad of one of the players who was a, I believe, eight year NBA veteran. We had a, uh, a, a father, one of the players who was a lifelong NBA assistant coach. And so, you know, they would all tell you that mindset. I mean, like, you know, if you're in, and that was, that was hard for me to learn. Cause I went, I came from a rural school where I was, you know, like a medium sized fish in the, in a puddle. And I got thrown into this, you know, in the situation where two months later, Jeremy Tyler is, is dunking on my head, uh, okay. at Bishop Gorman high school. Um, and in like, you know, it's one of those things where, like, you know, it, 
the mindset of it all yeah, it's 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 the baseline. If you don't have the mindset, you're not going to get far in basketball. And there's almost a selection bias because of that, where you know you get these headstrong players who get far, and then all of a sudden you have to also become like, you know, less headstrong and more nuanced as the pyramid continues to rise, and you have to accept that maybe your role has changed. And it, yeah, it's yes. Yeah, sorry, I cut you off on this long tangent. Good, I didn't really lead him. Yeah, <laughs> but, but keep going. Sorry. No, I, and and I mean, if you just think about all the players who are super successful and like they either come from a a player that was their father or mother like they're either the child of people who know what it takes and have been through it before and they learn from them or they come from adversity which if you're coming out of adversity that takes like you need the mindset to be able to get out of that anyway so they're like you you don't you rarely see that like suburban dude like I'm not just saying like suburban white or what it doesn't matter the race <laughs> no, no, you're just, like, right, yeah. just like regular like upper middle class like there's no upper middle class like NBA superstar you know it's just like yeah. either and if it is they're probably the son of a player it's, you exactly know? exactly that's what I'm saying so um and that's completely due to the mindset because first of all you need to be at a baseline athleticism wise and mindset wise to get into the NBA. Sometimes the athleticism completely overpowers it or the mindset is in like somewhat of a toxic formation that like makes you either extremely obsessed or it makes you like some players are just talented and athletic and they don't even fully like fully, fully love basketball. And it's right, more of an, right. like there is ends to a means basketball players. Oh, uh, and that's, that's one of the big secrets in the sport is that not even on a podcast that hasn't been released yet. I talk about how in my experience, working with a player who just loves the game is actually probably harder than working with a player. It's like, I really like the game. I like money more. You know, the player who loves the game has all these biases and you have to unpack all this stuff for like, they want to take the mid range, not because like they, you know, they care about winning or, or being paid more. They want to take the mid range because Kobe took the mid range, you know, where a guy is motivated and likes basketball and like is willing to work out and, and put in the time, but likes the money a little bit more. He's like, oh, yeah, I got that. It's no big deal. You know, well, just yeah. And, and it goes back to in that sense, when you're talking to that person, if you're if you're more money oriented, it's not ever going to, you know, ring the same way. Um, right. And 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 the, the ultimate goal is is generally not money to someone who is playing for the love of the game or for the legacy. The way the way I would talk to someone like that, it's like let's let's just take your random example of like oh because he loves Kobe. Obviously, there's a lot more nuance in that a lot of the time. Um, right. But but I would be like look like if Kobe for me I'm always curious about when is that Kobe turnaround fadeaway gonna be done from the wing three. Like, I feel like yeah. that is going to happen at some point, maybe not now because they're, but like someone is going to have the hand-eye coordination combined with the strength and the height eventually to start posting up wing threes yep. and just turn around Jay from the three. That's going to be crazy because well, you need- Go ahead. It used to be it used to be the the ultimate rule is that an off the dribble three pointer is never going to be an efficient shot. And then all of a sudden Steph Curry shows up and it's like, uh oh, this shot is potentially the most efficient shot. You know, and then like you're never going to be able that, to step yeah. back on the three point or whatever. And now that's yeah, like yeah, the, exactly. the staple of like every scorer is like, so many people are have that like sidestep move now um, that that they pull off in games. Uh, yeah. And, like I don't know if it started with Harden, but like Kyrie does it, Tatum does it, like anyone with decent footwork and of stable frame can pull off that shot because it's just a sidestep into a three. Like the mechanics and the body, the energy and the strength needed isn't that crazy if you have the balance and the sidestep down. So, Absolutely. so, so it's not even that crazy of a thought to take that shot. It's just never really been thought of as something that could or should be done. Um, and, and now you see it being done everywhere and right. it's, it's just, I don't even know where we were going with this one. <laughs> well, I, 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 I can actually tie it back. All right, this all sure. kind of goes back to where I was going to kind of take the ball from you, uh, talking about the mid range. And uh, you know, we talk about, uh, in my opinion, basketball is game of markets. And we talk about the market of efficiency as the most predominant market. And there's a reason for that. You know, if you win the points per play battle in an NBA game, you win. 89.7% of the time, you win the uh, points per play battle by 0.05 points per play or more, you win 97% of the time. Um, the other two markets that we, uh, that we don't talk about very often that are very you know, overarching, uh, the market of autonomy. You know, how much control do you have over, are you an independent variable? Or are you a dependent variable? So kind of goes to that thing of like, you know, Michael, Kobe. I you know, love that analogy, independent yeah. versus dependent variable, because it's just Absolutely. the same thing as like creator versus like, are you I, I forgot the words that I normally use for it, but I, I fully get where you're going. Go ahead. 
Yeah, and and so you know the guy the guys you think about the guys who are dominant from the mid range. You know they are high efficiency, high autonomy shooters where they can get to their shot whenever they want. And you know Michael Jordan never set the NBA completely on fire from the mid range. It was always a slow burn. You know it's like if we don't cut off Michael from the mid range, he's going to have 14 points on 12 shots, and that's a disaster. We play up on him. Oh crap! He just got eight points on five shots at the rim, and the game is now over. Um, you know so in in that in that way, if you're setting it, you know if you can get to your spot and you can hit it at like a 54 percent uh from two that's that's a nightmare for the opposing team and they can either die slow death or they can buy you know they can die the potentially higher variance death where they sometimes live um and then the third market which is you know you, you talk about how uh you know i I'm, I'm very aware that that a lot of my opinions are not uh openly voiced if at all held by many people in the basketball community but the third market that no one really talks about is the elasticity of this all where you know it's you know an economics term where you know there are certain players and i won't name somebody who's going to make people very upset with me but there are certain players who you put them in a game against a bottom five nba team they're going to look like an absolute superstar they're going to impose their their skill threshold they're going to impose their physical gifts on these players who can't defend at an incredibly high rate you put those same guys against a top five defense all of a sudden you know they're not athletic enough to get their moves they're not as skilled or as tight in their movements they're not as efficient in their movements and it all blows up in their face and so a lot of a lot of my opinions that go against the the common grain um on twitter that i sometimes catch a lot of flack for um are arguments born from more so than anything the third market of elasticity that then you know comes back and ties together with a market with with the markets of efficiency and autonomy because you know if you're an inelastic player so a player who is who can be dominated by the market of the opponents um you know your, your high efficiency aggregate numbers can't save you if you're a player well, it's it's sorry i i just want to oh, go ahead i just want to make it a little bit more layman's terms because i think yeah. i know what I, I think i know what you're saying so correct me if i'm wrong but what what it's yeah. making me think about is the same thing as like if you memorize a speech and you give the speech versus just going up and like freestyling a speech not freestyling but like just going up and like winging a speech that is just everything that you know or or it's like written versus freestyle rap in terms of or or it's like i'm gonna tie it all together don't worry it's yeah understanding the problem that you need to solve in the moment and making quick decisions based off that where i think what you're saying with the players that when you play a good defense it's like okay now they cut off the things you know or the things you have memorized it's like cramming right. for a test versus studying every day for a test it's like right. you can throw a lot of different problems at the guy who studies every day but to the guy who crammed just the night before you're not re like he's going to struggle a lot more and that's that's more leaning towards like People who have their go-to moves, if you stop their moves, they don't have, like, the ability to create off of new situations. They are just strictly in their moves. And I don't know if I'm completely off base with what you're saying, um, but that's just kind of what, what it made me think about. Because I think even, like, super athletic people, super athletic players can get stuck in this, like, I'm good at against bad defenses, but not against good defenses. And it's a lot in terms of basketball IQ. That's why I think shot creation plus playmaking is like the number one most important skill, overshooting, over defending. For me, defending is probably second in that sense, but it's kind of combined with the IQ. And then comes like the actual shooting. Now, if you're extremely elite at shooting, then you can overcome the playmaking, shot creation, or the defense if those are slightly lacking. And, and I, like I've kind of put this model on a lot of different things and i'm rambling again so i'm gonna go back no, to no, you no. i'm gonna go back to you with, <laughs> with like my 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 you know cram versus study every day type analogy so the, so the example that i always give people for elasticity is so i'm, I'm honestly a very good example for this i'm six eight I'm close to 300 pounds these days. I have a bad right knee. My left knee is not great, but it's a lot better than my right knee. Um, but I also dumped thousands of hours into basketball. Um, you know, if you put me on the court with your average, and like I, I you know, I, I go out to high schools in Minneapolis, and I, you know, I always do a little bit of teaching and a little bit of coaching, a little bit of educational uh, point. But I do love the game. Mm -hmm. So at the end of it, I want to get the kids out there, and I'm like, we're gonna play king of the court, you know. And then I, I score all the points because I've done this at a high level. I've scored on college defense. Defenders, you know, I've scored on D1 defenders that played against in high school where, you know, like I, I'm able to pick apart what you're bad at. And I've practiced this enough where, you know, like if you if you drop too often, I'm going to put my shoulder into you. I'm going to get to an 
five percent hook shot from eight feet away. You know, but if you speed me up, you know, if if, if you if you try to have me do the exact same thing against even D three defenders today, you know, the advantages that I have um, are completely overwhelmed by the length, the athleticism. You know, because I'm slow. I, I know my game very well. But if you speed me up, I'm unable to survive in that medium. You know, so it's it's a bit like it, it's like that. You know, if if you're not able to get to a certain thing that you do efficiently uh, with any amount of autonomy, you're probably dead as a lead ball creator against a defense is able to take away that one thing from you, and none of your counters that are branched off of that thing, you know, your your hang your hat skill are going to work because no one's reacting to take your skill away. They're doing it almost passively. You know. Well, that's the whole game, right? It's like it's like okay, let's. Let's find the thing that's going to slow this person down, and then the people that just can't be slowed down are generally the people who win the those best. championships, right? Like Kawhi's yeah. mid-range jumper, or LeBron posting up and finding shooters, or and then the on the other side of things, it's like okay, let's foul Steph Curry off ball every single possession, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then and then so they're not gonna call it every time, but that's his like that is Steph's like insane skill. Obviously, the shooting combined with it, but the reason why his teams are always just insanely better why he's on he's on the court is because he's just non-stop moving combined with that elite shooting so if you take away that non-stop movement aspect of making the entire team better then then you're taking one thing away like you know like one advantage away and then like okay now can he do the shots and that that's a whole nother thing where like sometimes he's injured or whatever but that's one thing is like Steph Curry not, doesn't have that like overcoming adversity finals win, right? He like if you kind of slow him down or stop him, he kind of got slowed down or stopped. Um, there, there's not that crazy like win that you didn't expect him to get. There are some games where he goes off like the series against the Cavs, the first championship, um, where he hit a bunch of shots and like 38 points in the fight or whatever. He has a few iconic games. But there's not that like, oh, there's no way he's going to get this. And then he actually gets it. And that's why he always is kind of a little bit further back in those discussions. This wasn't supposed to be a Steph Curry talk, but it's just kind of... <laughs> you no, know, I love talking about... I, I probably I probably value Steph Curry in the 90th percentile among people who you know have opinions, concrete opinions on Steph Curry. So I'm always down to talk about Steph. And you know, whenever I'm working, like I've shown Steph clips to I, I mean i'm working right now with a with a pick and pop seven footer and i'm probably gonna show him steph clips because part of the reason makes steph curry so great is because you know going to synergy last year he had a 1.52 points per play on unguarded yeah. catch and shoot shots so he's shooting above 50 percent from three and catch and shoot shots he also had over 200 possessions in catch and shoot shots is it in, in unguarded catch, catch and shoot shots it's he had finding, over he's elite at finding those shots because it's all exactly. ball movement exactly and it's, it's almost it's almost like a pride thing with him where he doesn't care if he embodies certain aspects of a role player. You know, like I always I always joke with people that like if you really get down and start really getting into it, it's hard to make an argument that Magic Johnson wasn't a role player. He just redefined what a role player could possibly do and affect the game. You know, if you go and look at the usage rates of those Laker teams, he's rarely, you know, even above 22, 23, 24 percent, if I'm uh, remembering correctly. But, you know, like he he embodied this this way of playing that just raised all ties raised all boats and you know so i'm always trying to get people to look at curry's off ball movement you know like it's the off the ball the crazy handles you know the the the, the you know all, all the, the bomb he hit against the thunder that stuff's incredible but if you want to get into the guts of how curry's winning championships it's giving the ball up early on short rolls it's moving in space and it's knocking down shots at high efficiency shot locations at high rates well what you it know? really is, is is quick decision making i think i think that's i think that's the number also, one I'm, Short rolling is great when you're giving up to Draymond Green. You know, like that's also who is also another quick decision maker. Exactly, I can't. I can't understand. You know, it, it's not so easy as you know, like I can't. I can't go to to Tomas Sadoransky and be like, "Hey, man, throw the short roll to Cristiano Felicio more often." You know, you guys are going to win seventy three games. <laughs> it, it doesn't work like that, obviously. But at the same time, you're like uh, trusting your teammate enough to give the ball up on the short roll is a very under talked about aspect of what makes good teams great teams or you know g good teams better than average teams. You know, if you want to watch a bad basketball team, they rarely make the play, you know, as far as like giving it up to to create a simple four and three advantage. They don't want to. They don't believe in it. So they, you know, they hoist bad shots instead. But sorry, I, I cut you off. No, it's all good. I, it actually just made me think about like Steph getting double teamed way out where he does. And then like Jordan or LeBron or Kawhi getting double teamed like in the mid range. I think it's interesting because that's a more... 
I can shoot from there type double. And once you create the space, like the guy that's doubling is rarely gonna get like that much closer than the guy that's actually guarding you. They're more stopping the momentum. But if you already know that you're gonna pull up before either player knows, then you could shoot over a double team and still make that shot if you're yeah. a high efficient shooter. And that's like Kobe, MJ, Kawhi, LeBron, like all these players that we're talking about. Um, they can shoot from there. The, the problem is, is Curry was getting double teamed like 30 feet which is interesting right. to me, which this is the first time that I've thought about this, is like, you can't take that shot on a double team from there. Um, yeah. Not saying it's never going to happen, it's just like highly unlikely that that's going to be a thing that happens. So the only thing Curry could do was give it up because he didn't have the option of pulling up like a lot of other people do. Right. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, uh, and to go back to your, your topic, like, you know, every single shot in basketball, we can observe the ball going in some percent of the time. You know, if you wanted to ride on my shoulders and, you know, hoist 90 foot shots uh, from the opposite baseline, it's going to go in at some point. It might bounce in, you know, it might hit the, the front rim and, and go in. It might go in at a 0.01% rate. You're going to score a points per play value above zero. Um, I, it, it's never a question of can you make that shot? Every shot on the court is makeable. The question is, what rates does do the, do the ball go in? You know, basketball is not a game of volume. It's a game of efficiency masquerading as a game of volume. Yeah, yeah. I think it's finding the allocation of, like, the, the points. So so volume, because it's all it's all limited within a certain time frame and however many right. positions you can obviously, fit. Obviously, it's about the, yeah, it's about the yeah. allocation. It's, it's, um, and position, my possession efficiency does feed a volume, but no one brings their volume independently. You know, and that's why when people look at someone like Russ, they're like, he's incredible, does all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, at what cost? You know, like, and he's been better at it in the last two months. But for a moment there, Russ was the ultimate empty stats, like raise all boats in Alaska against good teams, all star. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> anyway, let's get into actual some NBA teams. You know, this this has been. <laughs> A very fun conversation, honestly, and I'm sure a lot of these topics will kind of weave in and out. So let's just use this to talk about, you know, the the Philadelphia Ben Simmons Embiid situation. Oh boy, you're gonna get me in trouble. <laughs> um, you know, like I no, because because there's a lot of different types of thinking here. First of all, do you think that Simmons Embiid in a vacuum can work? And by when I say in a vacuum, I mean like if you had the right other players around him. Because that's, I think, one thing that's not talked about a lot. Oh, Embiid and Simmons can't play together. But it's just like, yeah, they can't play together if the other three players are Al Horford, Josh Richardson, and Tobias Harris. I think if the other players were like Joe Harris and, I don't know, a knockdown playmaker, I don't know, like maybe Drew Holiday and like some other knockdown four, stretch four type guy, maybe it's a little bit better. Um, I'm just curious, like, do those two player styles completely negate each other just because of their own play styles or is it a matter of putting more correct pieces around them well i mean in a sport with a with a salary cap um you know could could a hypothetical team exist where Embiid and simmons work together probably um is it at all practical to believe that could be created with in a sport with a salary cap absolutely not um, you know, the type of play, like when you actually break down, like what Joel Embiid would need to be successful, to be his best version of himself, to give the team, um, you know, the best chance to win the championship, you know, we, we have to first break down what is Embiid good at? Because there's a very interesting kind of myth that he's like good in pick and roll. He's statistically one of the worst rolling big men or popping big men in the NBA and has been for years. There's this kind of myth that like he's a beast on, on dump downs and like everyone in the NBA is good to some degree on dump downs. He's actually below average considering, you know, like the, the volume that he gets on dump downs, you know, shooting 60% roughly on dump downs is actually very inefficient. So just explain position. dump down real quick. Yeah, so you know uh, the the classic example of a dump down is uh, perimeter players getting downhill, centers hanging around the rim in the dunk spot, centers man helps over or helps up, uh, player dribbling the ball makes a, a short pass to the center who is then supposed to catch and finish. Sure. Um, you know, it, it's it's by play type the most efficient play type in the in all on, on all levels of basketball. You know, the best uh, the best three point shooters, Kenny Cliffs, the best dump down artist, but a dump down artist is generally you know the most efficient guy on the floor for all teams. Um, so to go back to the point, you know, so Embiid is incredible really at one thing. He's very good in the post. Um, the problem with the post, obviously, it's the most valuable real estate on the floor, um, and it, and it's a it's something that 
you cannot turn on and off when you want to because you know to be a post up player means you have to hang around the post looking for post up opportunities you know you you can't teleport from the right corner to the block instantaneously to take advantage of the look that you want to get you have to be kind of hanging around that area and of course you know you can vacate it but if you are seeking to get a post touch on that possession or in the next five seconds you are generally hanging around the post and so what you normally see when Embiid's on the floor is that he gets his efficiency he gets his his post up looks which are very efficient he scores at a 1.12 rate uh, for points per play which is very good Um, but it comes at the expense of less shots at the rim for his teammates and more floaters more pull-up jumpers more floaters and another hidden benefit to the defense is that when Embiid's on the floor opposing players on the perimeter know that that their center is already pre-collapsed at the rim it's probably not going to be effectively spaced out though and be tries to space to some degree and so those perimeter players are often playing up on the catch to try to make the three-point catch and shoot looks harder and so you know and then you add in someone like ben simmons who obviously his big flaw is that he doesn't like to he doesn't shoot threes at all um and also another under talked about flaw is that he doesn't want to go to the line he's very much outside of his uh you know of, of the mold of his archetype where most of these guys feast at the line lebron Giannis, you know lebron's a 69 percent free throw shooter but he still gets a ton of points in the free throw line at least it's marginally in, it's interesting because ben simmons like has so many examples of himself his best games are the games where he's just completely aggressive and i think right. he has increased the frequency of like being okay with just fully going in instead of either trying to get in with a floater or like not going in as hard to get to the rim but yeah he has his own examples to look at that like that is the best way for him to play anyway go ahead oh yeah i'm an ardent ben simmons defender i this is all of course i'm sure people have guessed by now this is all leading up to uh me saying that i would build around ben simmons before Embiid because i believe Embiid provides the higher floor but you know if the goal every single season for every single franchise is to move yourself closer to winning at least one championship if not this year in the future um i don't see a path to joel Embiid winning a championship in a league with a hard cap unless a very lucky string of variants happens which almost actually happened this year I assume this previous year where uh, the Toronto Raptors went stone cold and catch and shoot threes on an incredibly high volume and their best shooter like they, they walked away something crazy with like I think 45 less than point less points than expected in a seven game series from just open catch and shoot shots so that's already wild and they weren't able to overcome that anyway so I think I think Embiid you either have to win through a crazy run of variance which is completely outside of your control or you have to win because the NBA changes the rules uh, you know, the, the width of the lane or, you know, how much hand checking is allowed, you know, how much physicality is allowed near the post with Ben Simmons. I, I think it's pretty wild to me that people will argue that Ben Simmons and Giannis are not very similar players. Obviously Giannis can do more as far as like, you know, finishing with authority. Um, but I mean, they're both incredible defenders. They're both very hard to guard for the average point guard. Uh, you know, Ben Simmons turns it over a decent amount, but when you, you start looking into like, you know, the, uh, the relationships of like, you know, when this player is on the floor versus off the floor, most of his turnovers occur when Joel Embiid's on the floor, which also ties back to my overall arcing, uh, you know, overarching argument that it's harder to, to penetrate. It's harder to make decisions with Embiid on the floor. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would I, I would build around Simmons. I would try to build around in the Milwaukee mold. And I realistically don't think there's a way to salvage this. I think that, you know, if you're going to if you're going to take this middle path of trying to appease both masters in Simmons and Embiid, there's just no way for this work it's funny because i was having this argument with someone um on twitter i forgot who it was about like if you just took ben simmons uh, and put him in the exact situation as Giannis and took Giannis out um i was saying the bucks would still be contenders like i don't know if they're historic 70 pace bucks but i think they're still like top three four in the league bucks because I, I think it's still the best team in the east which might be a hot take considering how well toronto and and boston's been playing recently but like it's hard for me to look at the the gap between those two is so large even though i do think Giannis is better obviously it's i i in the right situation i just i can't wrap my head around the idea that it might be so large that the bucks would not be a force to be reckoned with you know it's just, first of all like ben simmons is otherworldly at vision and like seeing yeah. the court right so so that's one thing where yeah Giannis has a little bit more of the defensive dominance although Benjamin is a great defender um Giannis just has a little bit more length and can act as right. a rim, well, pro- I, I rim protector like more the, and I, th- I think he's the best most versatile defender in the league so it's hard to Ex- compare anybody to Giannis exactly but but Benjamin doesn't lack defense right so right so, so oh not at all but uh Benjamin does 
lap Giannis in terms of playmaking for others, but Giannis does have the, like, great, like, Giannis will put Ben Simmons in the rim, which is kind of crazy to me, like, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. like, that that do- <laughs> physical dominance is what uh, Ben Simmons can't match, and that's why, like, I'm saying the Bucks wouldn't be historic 70-win pace with Simmons, but they'd still be, like, tied 1-2 in the East type, like, still contending for a championship type team. I fully believe that, and it, it goes back to, like, the playmaking slash shot creation being the first most important skill for a basketball player after mindset and like physical, uh, just physical attributes. Um, right. And Ben Simmons has that in spades. Um, his own shot creation is lacking, but other people he can create a lot of shots for. His defense is, is there and it's elite. And then his shooting isn't there, but you can overcome that. Um, and it, there hasn't been a superstar, which is another thing what I've been thinking recently. There, No one has been all time at all three. Um, oh God! No. Yeah, that that player only exists in on the hard drives of PlayStation Twos, you know, <laughs> in, in in NBA Live 2005. <laughs> but but it's interesting because I think the defense can be over like once you have a certain amount of physical attributes, the defense can get to elite status. And then I think smart defense and basketball IQ and like playmaking for others generally are correlated because you can see the game in a smart way and and like in a slower way or you can see it's, yep. it's all about pattern recognition quickly so it you can see that it's the same patterns on both sides um right. like right in you fact, play I, defense I, and you play offense so you know that they're also playing offense and that they're also playing defense in terms of the opponent so there, there's a defensive metric i believe it's defensive plus minus where passing is actually weighted into the defensive aspect of the equation um, because of this exact, because there is a correlation between the best passers are are, are usually the best positional defenders. Um, you know how that also correlates with point of attack. It makes point of attack easier, but it won't overcome everything. But yeah, there, there is a correlation there. You're correct. Yeah, and it's not an analytical thing I've done. It's just like there's a correlation between pattern, quick pattern recognition in every single field, not just right. basketball. Right. Um, so if it's like related inside the field, it's even more correlated to me. Um, so and and in in any case. Uh, the, the shot creation for yourself is one thing that, like, he can't shoot, so it's more difficult, but he can get to the rim. Um, I think he, if he unlocked a mid-range that was semi-reliable, uh, that would completely change his game. Uh, he just doesn't have that either, which is why he still hasn't really unleashed, and also the, the Embiid situation. With Embiid, he has the elite defense, um, a little less versatile in terms of switching on, but he, he makes up for that a lot of the time. Um, and then what he could do i think and be the smart player i think if he focused on more on playmaking for others out of the post instead of because they're because there are post players that'll just they decide that they're going to post up and then oh, yeah. and then they just doesn't matter double team triple team like you're you're going to get that shot up <laughs> regardless um and, and you see that a lot with mb i think mb does make some plays out the post it's just with how centered the point of attack on defense is for the other team on Embiid it would be a little bit better for him to really focus on making plays for everyone else but then what you're saying and I think this is where I was trying to get to is it's tough because they're both super high usage players so if if you can't I'm not saying you can't have two bad shooters and still create and still can't create a great team. I, th- I think you can. It's just their strengths and their usage is based off like them being the main guy. Um, and and they're just players where you can either be the main guy and you can't be the second guy. And I think Ben Simmons is a prime example of that type of player. Um, whereas if there is a second guy, he needs to be a Clay Thompson type guy or like Paul George type guy that can play off ball and then create when he's in the and like plays better because Ben Simmons is so good but Embiid just the way that he plays it's just really tough because he's in the spot that Ben Simmons needs open to be effective oh yeah absolutely it's it's fun I mean one of one of the most common uh things that I do in my consulting is I look at a team and I identify a player who is too high usage for the starting lineup. And I recommend moving him to the bench and I recommend inserting a bench player who has a more complementary skill set at a much lower usage into a la the... Will, Lou Williams. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, example, exactly. you know? It's, it's, t- it's tough to hear that at, at, at almost any level of college basketball because, you know, like you, you look at your players and you're always just going to be subconsciously probably comparing them to the guys in the NBA. And it's like, you know, I don't I don't have three guys who can get their own shot on the floor at the same time. And the average college team has maybe two of those guys on the floor. 
uh, at any given time. Two guys who can go create their own high quality look. Um, three, you probably win the NCAA championship in Division One. Um, but yeah, it's it, there's so much in basketball, and that's kind of why I always kind of scoff at you know th- there are some people who have much greater followings than me who love talking about you know the break even of of doing this action of putting this usage rate on and you know at this efficiency will will lead to you know uh, the the benefit among four other players on the floor that'll then raise everybody else like you know it's it's a great strategy you know to to have the usage sponge out there if you're trying to win you know 60 roughly percent of games if you're trying to win a championship you just have to chase efficiency you know in in all forms if, if you if you can embrace efficiency and, and you know that, that align with the macro concepts of you know like spacing and uh you know penetration threes freeze and layups if you can align all that with efficient actions among your players and an efficient mindset among your team you are going to make deep runs well what so so one thing that um i see and with you about Embiid, i did want to talk about I think there is a way you can win a championship with Embiid if you surrounded him with the right players. Because I think once you create a double team, you are inherently advantaged. And and the teams that can most efficiently or most often create double teams and then subsequently efficiently utilize those mismatches right. on the other end can can do a lot. And I think Embiid, it's extremely tough to really guard Embiid successfully, single team, um, just straight up. I think that you're almost always going to double. And I think if you focus Embiid's energy in terms of passing out of doubles more efficiently, and then if you had a second star that was more complimentary to where he can make plays out the doubles or... I, I guess the clogging the lane type situation can d- disrupt a lot for even more complimentary players sort of Embiid. I just think that his dominance down low uh, c- can unlock a championship caliber offense. Um, and, so then, and then his defense is already like at that level where just him alone is, is n- generally a decent defense. And if you surround him with decent defended players, you'll have a great defense, which we haven't really been talking about defense that much today anyway. Right. And it's it's also funny, like in this era of hyper like media exposure, you can always find clips of whatever you're looking for. You know, you could find a clip of uh, of Steph Curry posting somebody up probably, you know, um, I, I would agree with you in the sense of, you know, if if 100 percent of post touches with Embiid resulted in a double team, it'd be a no brainer. The issue with Embiid, and this comes back to elasticity, is that there are teams that you will almost always run into in a situation where you need to win uh anywhere between 16 to 28 games against four different teams in seven game series, one NBA championship, there will almost always be a team that can handle Embiid to the sense where they don't need a double team when this player is a primary defender in the majority of situations. And, you know, if you're paying a guy a max contract slot, he's clogging the lane and his one thing gets taken off the table. Uh Oh, you know, you're not, you're not winning that series very often. And, you know, those players that don't need to double team Embiid, um, are not as rare as people think. I think the perception of Embiid, um, kind of, you know, perception molds reality to a certain, uh, point, but the perception of him as this low post dominant beast, um, is to he's, an extent overinflated. You know, there, there's some empty calorie, you know, monster games against teams that ha- didn't have a prayer to guard him. And are those games worth something? Yeah, it means you got a high floor. But, you know, if you're trying to win the championship, you need a high ceiling. I don't necessarily think that it's only empty calorie games. I think it's he's too high variant against Absolutely. good defenders. Like, he's Absolutely. pretty solid. Like, he'll destroy teams that can't guard him. He can also destroy teams that can guard him. It's just when it comes to the playoffs, it's, in a sense, at least until now, it's been seen that he can't do it consistently enough against the good defenders, but he can do it. And and, and like I said, it's it's about the small sample size. Because he could, if he does it for four out of seven games, which I think he's capable of, then you win a series. Um, right. and, and, and in that sense, I think he does have that skill set. He is extremely skilled. Uh, it's, it's just tougher to make it work. Um, it's, it's interesting. I was just thinking about like what you were saying about a guy sometimes too high usage to be in the starting lineup because the usage needs to go to this other team to be more efficient. Like what if Embiid was just like the 
the like the ultimate the, super the, sick the man all, yeah. the all-time <laughs> al jefferson like you know, <laughs> yeah man the you know, all-time al jefferson that's a great like line. the all-time al jefferson Embiid is just destroying bench units and like you don't even know what you're doing but then it then it'll just come back to like okay let me let me just find like the minimum contract aaron baines or like robin lopez to just you know rough him up off the bench or whatever so right. um Anyway, a lot of different thoughts there. <laughs> it's, it's funny, too. I mean, the center position is so offensively scheme dependent that, like, I would argue that, like, there's, like, you know, you, you, the concept of fog of war, right? Where, like, you don't always know everything about every entity on the battlefield. There's this almost, like, league-wide center fog of war where, like, you know, Aaron Baines is a great example. He was a screen setter for so many years for the Spurs and the Celtics. And then he goes to the Suns and people are like, wait, this dude can pass the ball like that? And he can he can make threes at a certain rate? And, like, I always joke with people, you know, he's like, I'm a former big man. It's like, you know who probably knew that he could pass like that, that Aaron Baines could pass like that? I bet Aaron Baines did, you know, and he yeah. was going to the coach like every month being like, I, I promise I can I can throw these nice passes if you if you set up a system around me. But, you know, it kind of goes back to that thing. Like there's so few data points on like, you know, uh, you know, giving centers reign to make those decisions in the passing game. We're like, you know, there's almost this like built in idea that like you have to be like a generational talent, it's like Bill Walton, or you know, to whatever, like be yeah. given. Yeah, exactly. To be to be given even you know, like the opportunity over a five game sample size to to show what you can possibly do. And you know, like I, I I'm I did a thread about a, a year ago that was all about you know signal and noise and the best teams seem to be able to to find these players, you know, in the rough, these diamonds in the rough who are not good at many things but are undervalued in shooting or undervalued in like you know a certain aspect of defense and they grab them they get them on minimum contracts and then all of a sudden you know they're providing eight eight nine ten million dollars of surplus value you know millions of surplus value off the bench and you know you got a team that's, that's paying somebody you know who is a, a floor you know raising guy ceiling lowering guy off the bench like a jamal crawford is, is a classic example and you know, like you just you can't compete on those terms. You know, like what that does, like you know how much money you're able to put on the floor, basically, is just is so stratifying between not stratifying, but um, you know, just just yeah, you get what I'm saying, right? No, I, I get what you're saying, and it's just <laughs> it's just the, to, to to wrap up the Embiid and, and Simmons point, and we'll probably start to wrap up overall anyway. But um, Embiid is for me the big man, the center is the third piece to building a team for me. Um, and, and like when you get into max contract centers, it's like inherently, and when I say the third piece, I say I need an all around wing who can like, you know, create plays from like create shots for himself. And then also like kind of do a little bit of everything, um, is, is the first guy I want on my team. The second guy is the shooting playmaking combo guard. Like as long as he's not a sieve. Um, defensively, as long as you can right. like, reliable shot and then run a decent pick and roll, like and then hide him on defense. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I, ideally he'd be a great defender, but those guys are so rare, you know. But like, you well, know, well, the yeah, hiding... I mean, it's all it's all scale. So like, I'm trying to generalize in a non generalizable field, and that's where kind of Jokic <laughs> Jokic kind of comes in in the in the third piece. But like Curry is like you got to hide him on defense, but he's so elite at both the shooting, the, like the shot creation for himself and inherently others because of his ability to double and then it immediately opens the advantage which is creating plays for your team um right. just by pulling the double so anyway like that wasn't what i was trying to get to but if you can run a play make the right decision and like aren't and can shoot um that's my second type of guy that i want in team building and then the third guy is like a defensive anchor but also switchable type center that do generally doesn't cost you much. Obviously, if you want to stretch yep. it, have a stretch five, that's a different story. And you, you can build teams if you have the first team, like first two guys where you have a stretch five, that's a different story on the defensive end. You got to figure it out. Um, maybe your wing is that elite center, which is what we see with Giannis. So you don't necessarily need that center. You just need more shooting around it. I mean, then those are more like an ancillary decisions. But to have a, that's why like I get into a lot of gripes with Gobert because he's amazing at what he does it's just how incrementally better is it than like the next center that you could get and then allocate those resources to bettering another part of your team that's you know for me and then that's why i can't really quantify Jokic as much because he's so different and just creates so much place for everyone else and can also post up and can also shoot so you can like play stretch he's not an awful defender because he's super smart which is where the iq comes in that Jokic, i'm very like 
torn on, which is a whole nother thing. But that's right. why I love the Michael Porter Jr. emergence. And if he reaches his potential, then the Nuggets become a from a fake contender to an actual contender if MPJ really pops. Um, but anyway, that's a, that's a long ramble to me saying that you're paying max money for a high usage third piece in my team building strategy and that's subjective on me i'm not saying this is objectively true for anyone it's just like my team building strategy doesn't really lend itself to picking guys like gobert or, or Embiid to be on my team right you know the world's trying to think of five minutes ago polarizing you're describing you know potentially players of potentially very polarizing value and paying a player a potentially polarizing value a lot of money is running a huge risk and you know it's funny all i'm hearing right now is arguments for working with one player at a time very nuanced you're all i care about i know you're getting better than everybody else you do you and let everybody else try to figure out how the pieces fall together we're going to take care of us which is what i do how much like, money you, sorry how much money yeah. is the money you're giving him or that player making for everyone else so for me right. it's just like how many so you're giving 25 million to this one player and he's giving you let's say 25 million exactly in value but how yep. much money or value are you getting out of the other players because of that you one player you skipped on them because, yeah exactly right it's, so like mb you can get 35 million worth of value for by paying him 30 million that's positive right you, he's probably more than a max player but the sum and this is where i think a lot of like you it's hard to quantify this but how much money is the improvement of everyone else else around him worth and i think right. that's where Embiid and gobert fall a bit short as uh whereas guys like curry and like Kawhi or like you know just the wings and uber shooter guards like Lillard is another one of them um or like Steve Nash like extreme playmakers like Jokic they make a, a lot more of that value up um with just the improvement of everyone else around them right and you're, you're also you're touching on two other main concepts of building a team which is interchangeability you know like how well you're able to continue doing the scheme that you want to do when the best guy isn't on the floor and what you know what money allocations you need to make on the uh on the players around him you know, to keep that scheme going, or is it just very seamless? And then also rigidness. You know, Joel Embiid demands a rigid style of play. And like, obviously, like you know, you give the precedent to Kawhi, to Steph, you know, to these guys who win titles, uh, to LeBron. But like, realistically speaking, I mean, like you know, you could be as flexible as you want offensively with those three guys. And you know, like, if you wanted to make Steph Curry off the ball, he can make that adjustment. You know, if you want, if you want Kawhi to do anything offensively, he can do it. The same, you know, goes for LeBron to even a greater extent. And like, you know, I, I think that's another underrated aspect of it you know if you have a very rigid uh you know unbending offensive player giving you a lot of money to who also demands the scheme be you know accommodating to him exactly that rarely wins championships yeah uh, and and yeah i think we're gonna wrap it up here um, yeah <laughs> we got through two topics we did good <laughs> we, we, we did well we, we did really well um yeah, this this was this was the, our own version of seven thousand words on the mid range. I swear, I swear. No, this was this was a a fun conversation. I think we we hit on a lot of different team building aspects. This is the kind of stuff that I actually wanted to talk about because of some fun stuff going on uh, next week that I can't really talk about right now. But you'll find out in a few months. Um, and yeah, appreciate everyone listening. Uh, Joe Joseph, what do you want to plug here for the people before we head out? Oh, uh, I, I never really have any plugs, never but plugged. thank you for asking, yeah. <laughs> All right, for sure. Well, yeah, nothing else more to say. Hit us up at the Bench Mob NBA. Uh, we'll talk to you another day. Peace.